and they come on. There's connected. Wow, we've got a chat panel. How do you turn this way? They're connected. I'm going to take his word at that. I didn't hear any anything click. I just heard a bunch of beeping. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Um, so hopefully that will be that will work for us. Hi, this is the. Uh, the webinar series on restorative justice, the webinar for today on restorative justice. And we're going to begin at the top of the hour, so if you'll just uh, stay with us for a little bit, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Hi, we're about five minutes out from beginning the webinar on restorative justice. Uh, my name is Drew Carberry with the National Crime Prevention Council, and we'll begin at uh, the top of the hour, uh, as soon after the top of the hour as we can. Uh, Drew? Yes, sir? Do you have a moment? Um, I, I'm seeing the screen. It says Weed and Seed Vista Initiative. Right. Uh, that's the sort of overarching um, project that I'm under that's sponsoring the webinars. Oh, wow. Hi, this is Drew Carberry from the National Crime Prevention Council. We're going to begin our webinar in a few minutes, about three minutes at the top of the hour. Uh, today's webinar is on restorative justice. 
We're going to feature the programming at the uh, Brattleboro, Vermont Center for Community. Um, no, we get right. Community Justice Center. Sorry. You got um, it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I work with a Center for Community Safety a lot, and I just fell into that trap. Hi, Drew. Are you there? I, I am. Is this Gloria? This is Gloria, yes. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, we're going to start in about two and a half minutes. Um, we're just sort of holding for the top of the hour. Okay. Good to hear your voice. Good to hear yours. Um, I'm doing my master's in criminal justice, and I just when I looked at this, I'm going, wow, this is a fun, fun class. Oh, very good. Okay. Yeah. Well, it worked out good. I hope uh, we don't let you down, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> well, you won't. <laughs> uh, I just learned today I'm going to be in Milwaukee in May. What day? Uh, May 19th. Oh, that's the day. That's AmeriCorps week. That's the day we're having our closing ceremony. Where will you be? Um, Devil's Lake, which is up by Wisconsin Dells. Oh, uh, well, I won't make that. But yeah, it's across the state. Right, right. Um, but I am going to be in Milwaukee on, let's see, the 20th for the service learning um, conference. Okay. I think it's in Oconomowoc. I'll have to figure out what my uh, itinerary is, but uh, if you can work it out, that would be great. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah, this is Mel from the Community Justice Center, and I actually, I'm a Wisconsinite myself. Hi. Hi. I actually I lived in Madison for four years before I moved to Vermont. You didn't miss the winter this year, trust me. Oh, I heard all about it. <laughs> oh, it was bad. Sounds rough. I mean, I we had a winter up here of our own, but uh, I yeah, think you guys broke some records. We did. Yeah. Hi, this is Drew Cardberry with the National Crime Prevention Council. We're going to begin our uh, webinar today in about a minute. I uh, want to get to the top of the hour so we can include everybody that wanted to attend. And uh, we'll pick up the, um, the conference call part, and we'll begin the webinar in about a minute. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Drew. You know, this is bleeps. Are people joining? Now, Gloria, are you online? Can you see, or are you just on the conference call part? Um, I, I will be online in just a minute. Oh, okay. I'm, or I think I will be. Uh huh. Um, I'm going to the webex.com. Okay. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Drew Carberry, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar today. Uh, we're pleased to have with us uh, representatives from the Brattleboro, Vermont Community Justice Center, and they're going to do a presentation, but I want to do a few ground rules in a, uh, first before we begin. Uh, simply, the ground rules are that uh, we're on the WebEx uh, webinar system, which is the first time I'm trying it. We've changed vendors in a way. And this is at my first foray into that. So uh, this is WebEx, so please be a little patient with us as we, as we uh, proceed with this. I don't know all the display buttons and the right buttons to push, as I did with the other format, but we'll try it. Um, 
The other thing is that if you have to, um, if you can on your phone during the conference call, if you could either use the mute button or press star seven, and that typically will mute most phones. If you um, want to unmute to ask a question or something, you can try star seven again, and that would unmute. Those are just a few of the ground rules. Zach and Mel, who are going to present for us in a moment, thought that they, maybe they would go through the presentations and then leave time for questions and answers closer to the end or to the middle of the, con of the uh, session. But if you have something that's pressing or you need to clarify something, then just speak up or raise your hand electronically either way, and we'll try to answer that question, just the ones for clarification or if you didn't understand something or just wanted uh, some elaboration on something. But if you have a question that's a discussion question, why don't we save that till the middle or later part of the presentation. So once again, the mute button is uh, star seven, and then on mute is star seven again, if you can do that. Uh, if you want to stay live during the time, that's fine, but I ask you to uh, refrain, refrain from typing or, or uh, be quiet or other conversations, I suppose. So today is a uh, webinar about restorative justice, and once again, I'll just iterate that uh, this is the first time I've used this software, and hope that you can uh, be patient with that, that I'm trying to move there. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Green Mountain Justice Restoring Community in Vermont. We have with us representatives from the Brattleboro Community Justice Center. We have Mel Motel, who's the coordinator there. And hello. That, hello, Mel. And then Zach Trent, who is an AmeriCorps VISTA serving at that site. Yep, hi, uh, Good morning and good afternoon, I should say. Um, so what we'll do is we'll proceed with the presentation. I'll try to activate it here. We have a couple polling questions. Uh, the presentation is one hour long, or uh, we hope to be done at 4 o'clock uh, either way, uh, 4 o'clock Eastern. And uh, that's sort of the, the scene as we have it. So um, uh, Mel has been involved in reentry for a while. Now, Zach, you're going to begin the presentation? Uh, well, yeah, Mel can introduce us. And okay. Then, uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. Mel Motel has been involved in reentry for a number of years, as, as you may have heard on the pre-conference call. Um, she sort of cut her teeth in Wisconsin on the reentry issue, working out of the Madison Urban Ministry and enjoying that. And then she's transferred that to Vermont. And uh, Zach Trent, the other presenter, is an AmeriCorps VISTA with an extensive and varied background, and he'll fill you in on that. But if it's uh, okay with you, I'll turn it over to Mel Motel to begin our presentation. Great. Thanks, Drew. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We're, we're really honored to have such a, uh, what seems like, diverse group with us, and, and we're sure that you all have so much expertise in areas that are, are new to us, and we're hoping we can do a little enlightening regarding restorative justice, how, how the Vermont Department of Corrections has implemented restorative justice with regards to reentry, and, and to try to give you um, a good idea about not just the theory, but the practice. How do we implement restorative justice with reentry on a um, on a day-to-day -day level? So um, there are a few different sections to our presentation. Um, the first one is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of restorative justice in the, the Vermont Department of Corrections. Then we're going to talk a bit about restorative justice basics. We're going to talk a bit about our programs at the Brattleboro Justice Center, which is just to situate you in southern Vermont, um, southeastern Vermont, sort of touching uh, New Hampshire and also Massachusetts. And then we're going to invite um, a couple of wonderful folks, um, Javon and Karen, who are um, a participant and a probation officer, respectively, to talk a little bit about their experience and answer your questions. Um, I just briefly want to thank Drew Carberry for arranging this. We're really honored that he asked us to talk. Um, we also really want to thank um, Derek Miedovnik, Hans Johnson, John Gorsick, Howard Zare, David Peebles, and Jan Dembinski um, from various agencies and uh, individuals who really helped us put this together. And also thanks in advance for Javon and Karen, who will be joining us later. Uh, and as Drew said, please try to hold questions until the end of our presentation, unless it's, it's uh, for clarification or if Drew prompts you to participate in some way. We'll have about 15 minutes for discussion, hopefully, at the end. So I'm going to hand it over to Zach to start. Thanks. Great. Um, can everyone hear OK? All right. I guess for the people who are muted. Folks <laughs> are on mute and probably okay. All right, great. 
All right, uh, Drew, can we go ahead and advance? All right. Um, so my goal is really to explore explore um, how restorative justice was chosen um, to be a framework for the Department of Corrections in Vermont. And um, Mel is really going to fill us in on what restorative justice is uh, as a philosophy and as a practice. So we're looking at a problem. Um, 1990, the then Department of Corrections Commissioner, John Gorsick, was looking at um, some very serious issues. And um, three of the most serious were that the one that the population of, of prisoners was growing at an unsustainable rate, um, overcrowding and ever increasing strain on the state resources, um, really highlighting uh, an ongoing problem. And um, a quote from John just to illustrate that problem says, in 1991, by some measures, Vermont was the most overcrowded prison system in the nation, with demand at 191% of capacity. Uh, we certainly had one of the highest out counts in the country, 20% of the sentenced population on the street. So that was a, a glaring reality that the department was looking at. Another was that social <coughs> science was really beginning to illustrate that, that the current approach to corrections just wasn't working. I mean, you had, uh, you know, a one half or two thirds of prisoners going back to prison within uh, years, and um, <clears throat> there was really some emerging research that we'll look briefly at. Um, but I should definitely highlight Jonathan Braithwaite's work, "Crime, Shame, and Punishment." And um, really, I say the strongest idea to take away from this is that informal social control was really valuable. Uh, in, in keeping people from reoffending. So that's something that we'll look at as we go forward, but we'll highlight a little bit more of that research in a moment. And also, public opinion of the department was, was really unfavorable. Um, I mean, we've all heard anecdotes of people being slapped on the wrist for crimes that we feel are very serious. And uh, when working in Rancho, many of us know that overcrowding really can kind of keep people from spending as much time as a lot of people would like for crimes committed. Really through, uh, through newspapers, letters, public meetings, it was really becoming obvious that, that the public was not satisfied with the, with the department's performance. Uh, another quote from John says, uh, a castigated corrections nightly has the revolving door and using corrections math. And victims community, that's the people you know, most affected by crime, declared us to be the enemy. So uh, these are really serious problems. and. Uh, uh, John Gorsick and many others in the department really wanted to know what to do about it. Great. A nice flashy animation down there. Um, so we know things aren't working, but what should we do? Uh, the department really wanted to know what the public expected of them, and um, they needed to know that so they could evaluate what to change. So the first question that really came out was, what does the public want from us? And um, it was decided that um, there, was, there was a need for some serious market research, and the department hired John Doble and Associates. Uh, this was also in the 90s. And uh, this was a professional marketing team who had worked for large corporations. Um, and they, they, really, um, they really persuaded the department that they could take uh, public opinion and really quantify it or Put it, put it in words that, that could lead to actions. And uh, from that market research, I mean, it, it lasted for months, and it was very in-depth, including interviews and phone calls, a lot of hard work. Um, some of the results from that was that the department learned that people really, of course, wanted to be safe from crime and from violent predators. Uh, that wasn't really, you know, news. Uh, also, they wanted pe people to be held accountable for their crimes. and. Um, um, really felt dissatisfied with um, with the level of accountability for people who had committed crimes. Also, people wanted to have uh, adequate I don't mental think so right now. Care. and they also wanted Sorry. some assurance that uh, the department was doing a good job with taxpayer dollars. They also this was kind of news. They wanted the damage caused by the crime to be repaired, and um, 
you can really read into that and assume that, you know, most of the time when you put someone behind bars, that the actual damage to the crime isn't going to be necessarily fixed. Now, the largest revelation, we can go on. The department found out that the local community actually wanted to be a part of the corrections process. Um, we've all heard the phrase, not in my backyard. Well, Vermonters were actually saying, yeah, you know, in my backyard, uh, <laughs> I want to become involved. And uh, it, it, I, it was news, and it really, it really allowed the department to consider doing a systems change and, um, and really allow themselves to be challenged by this new, this new data. As far as the local community wanting to actually be a part, there were some very specific things that they heard. One was that local communities didn't want corrections to be at arm's length. Um, they wanted to be involved, and they didn't want to be removed from the process as a whole. They are also hearing that they wanted the harm done by the crime to actually be addressed in the community in which it occurred. And, um, you know, this, this was news, that, that people wanted to become involved and, do, and address the crime where it happened. Also, local communities uh, wanted to make some progress in, in reducing and addressing crime and conflict in their neighborhoods, and they were willing to be a partner with corrections and in administering justice. So the goal is to involve community in corrections. So how does that happen? Well, around the 1990s, a lot of ideas began to emerge that really allowed the department to take some, some uh, basically concrete steps in, in, in involving the community in a safe and effective manner. Uh, some of this research had to do with evolutionary biology, and it really, uh, you know, Upset of that was the sociocultural evolution, and really began to ask, what is it in our culture that allows people to respond effectively to crime and to keep from committing new crimes? And again, those are things like informal social norms and the idea of reciprocity, um, that I will treat you as you will treat me. And um, really, you need to have a conversation in order for, for this idea to take place, as opposed to people just being thrown behind bars. Uh, another big movement was the social capital movement, and um, this basically, you know, let people know that that social networks are very powerful in the community, and that really challenged the, challenged the department to reach out and to begin to look at reentry as not just a department-owned uh, a department-owned function. Also, evidence-based practices, which really, um, you know, makes sense. Now, but basically, it just says that decision makers really have to base base their actions on on uh, scientific data and on uh, you know practices that that are evidence based to uh, to get results. It's kind of you know kind of difficult for uh, uh, for social agencies. And then finally, well, you know, another big one is restorative justice, and uh, Mel is kind of really talk about that in particular. But just so you know, it's, it's actually a framework for justice. And uh, to, to put it in a nutshell, it's, it views crimes as a violation of relationships. So we'll look at that a lot closer later. Zach, um, let, me, let me see if I can try one of these polling questions with your permission. Is that OK? Sure. And maybe if we can just see who's on the, um, on the call, I will try to summon that up, see if I can actually get this done. Um, Okay, um, uh, I guess the first question we have is, uh, what type of organization do you uh, belong to? And so maybe you can either click on that if that's possible. Are you seeing that in a proper way? Or, you, or we have some response? No, it's good. Are you seeing it, Zach? Zach, are you seeing it? Yeah, it's, it's here. Okay. It's good. Okay. So we're getting some responses. I appreciate that. So it looks like um, we have a pretty good distribution of, um, I can't tell, I can see the bar graph, but I can't see the numbers. But it looks like we have a pretty good distribution among uh, community-based, faith-based, and corrections, and maybe some uh, with others trailing the field a little bit. So that's the sense of who's on the call. So I hope that helps us see who uh, our audience is. I'm going to close the poll now.
And uh, Zach, you can resume, I guess. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, so restorative justice was decided to be the safest and the most effective model to use in involving the community, which was, you know, a stated goal from the community. And um, as Mel describes restorative justice, I think you'll you'll really grasp why why it's so valuable if you want the community to be involved in in administering justice. Um, so real quick, restored justice was first used in Vermont through low-level probation offenses, and that was through the reparative program, which we'll touch on closer in a moment. And later, restored justice was used through the Serious and Violent Offender Reentry Initiative, the Savori Grant, and that was actually when we began to use restored justice through the reentry uh, process. And uh, just to highlight, the state legislature really valued restorative justice and actually put it into state law. Okay. Can, can we move on? Oh, great, thanks. Um, just a little more about the reparative boards. That actually began as a Department of Corrections owned program um, that was using community volunteers, but the, uh, the centers where it was happening were actually corrections offices, and there's one in each county. And this really caused some problems. Uh, the DOC was running it from top to bottom, so it really didn't feel like it was community owned. And also, if you do, if you're addressing crimes in a one county office, you may have a crime committed in one town, but you have volunteers from another town. And that really is going around the goal of addressing harm done in the communities in which it occurred, which was another stated goal that the department worked on. So, uh, you know, they, they continued to work on this, and eventually, they decentralized the program, and it's not uh, DOC run from top to bottom. And uh, it's actually the uh, first community justice center established in Burlington through a partnership from the mayor and Commissioner John Gorsick. So that's a little bit about um, bringing RJ on. So, this is a, an interesting question. We, we saw that working with lower level offenders was really valuable. So the department wondered, the hypothesis was, would the community want to be involved in the reentry of folks with uh, crimes like sex offense, domestic abuse, rape, and murder? So you might think about that yourself. Do you think the community would want to work with folks with crimes like these? Okay. And uh, the DOC reasoned that indeed community as stakeholders would want to be involved in the reentry of folks with crimes like these. And we see this as a reality all throughout Vermont. Community members and victims are working together to uh, ensure the successful reentry of folks with uh, crimes that typically keep them from reintegrating into the community. Let me see if I can pull up that other question, um, Zach. Okay. Let me try that, see if that's the right question this time. Um, Uh, all right, so what, what would we respond, those of us on the call, how, would we, we respond the same way as, as Vermont folks did as a community? Let me see if I open that. Let me, sorry, let me open that. Okay, try that. Okay, the results are coming in. And apparently... Uh, uh, the answer true that most most folks on the call represent that their community would also be, want to be involved with offenders who were um, serious and violent offenders. So that, that that probably mirrors what you came up with in Vermont, Zach. Excellent. So cool. I'm going to close that poll now. Great. Okay. Um, so just to uh, kind of wrap things up, so you know some information about the Justice Centers in Vermont. Uh, today we have 12 community justice centers throughout the state. All of us are using restorative justice either with low-risk low probationers, returning prisoners, or both like the center here in Brattleboro. And all centers have some tie to the local town government and work closely with Department of Correction staff to protect our community volunteers and to make sure that they are practicing restorative justice effectively. And um, 
we wouldn't be doing our presentation, ju presentation justice without talking a little bit more about Mr. Gorsick, who was the uh, commissioner at the time. Many attribute bringing restored justice to Vermont as of his hard work and willingness to challenge health and, and the department. So a quick quote. We have a very good, at, good view of what doesn't work. We're beginning to understand that restorative approaches that place the victim at the center and that embrace the principles of focusing on understanding the harm done, on repairing the damage to the relationships with community and victims, on adding value, on acknowledging responsibility, making amends, and on being sorry, are more likely to work than what we are doing now. So um, now we can hear from Mel and uh, really look at restorative justice and, and get a clear view of why it's so valuable. Thanks, Zach. Okay, so as Zach said, I'm going to talk a little bit about this restorative justice concept. Um, since I am not in a room with any of you all, I can't really get a sense of uh, how many folks are familiar with restorative justice and how many are not. So I'm going to go with the assumption that um, no one knows anything. Sorry if I end in one um, <laughs> by stating the obvious. And of course, this is the kind of conversation we could have for hours and days, but uh, we'll try to do it in about, I don't know, six minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the restorative justice system that so attracted the, the Vermont Department of Corrections and uh, how we put it into practice. Um, restorative justice is a, is a needs-based philosophy. Um, traditional criminal justice system, the stakeholders, involved uh, when a crime is committed, it's not just the offender and it's not just the state. You know, when, when there's a criminal justice proceeding after a crime is committed, it's usually the state of Vermont or whatever versus the person who committed the crime. But what restorative justice says is the victim and his or her needs is important. Um, these are just a few needs that we commonly see when we speak with victims and um, find out how, the, how they're feeling and what's going on after a crime has been committed. Um, a lot of times a victim, um, someone who's been, who has been offended against, needs information. You know, where, where is the perpetrator? Um, a lot of times folks who have been offended against, their perpetrator goes to prison and they don't know when the person's coming back and they don't know if, if they're going to be safe or not. Um, another need that we hear about a lot is, is being heard. Often the victim or survivor, uh, their story is lost in the whole uh, shuffle and that basically mostly focuses on the offender. Um, another need that we hear from victims is, is the need for safety. Um, gee, well, you know, someone is, is around town who, who beat up my, my, my husband or sexually offended my daughter. I don't feel safe here and I need to be safe. Um, and restitution or vindication is another need that, that we hear about a lot. Um, people feeling like they need to be repaid for the damages they sustained, um, be it monetary or material or, or spiritual. Um, I mean, if you think about think about a rape, um, I'm sure many of you uh, might know a survivor of a rape. Can you think of a time when the needs of the person who was raped weren't met, when, when maybe that person's story was discounted or ignored from the very beginning after the offense is committed? You know, someone will go the police station and their story will be discounted. Um, and time and time again, victims are pretty much pushed outside the room. So restorative justice is thinking about these needs and trying to acknowledge them. Um, another person or people that um, have a stake in an offense that's committed is the offender or offenders. Um, offenders need safety too. If you think about if anybody works with sex offenders, um, among many and the other barriers that they experience upon reentering the community. Safety is a big one. Um, people get pretty, and rightfully so, pissed off about, about people who have committed sex offenses, and um, there's a lot of stigma surrounding it, and a lot of people need to worry about their safety. Are they going to get hurt? Um, are vigilante squads going to come up as living health? So that's, um, you know, that's a need that we need to address. Um, longing, connection support, encouragement to experience personal transformation, those are all needs that we, um, that we end up addressing when we work with folks who are coming back to the community after being incarcerated. I'm sure you all can think of some other needs um, if you work with or know or are someone who's been offended against or someone who has offended. And another stakeholder to um, take note of is the community. And that's another really important stakeholder in restorative justice processes. 
think about um, you know, burglary. If a burglary takes place uh, down the block, even if you weren't a direct victim, um, in a way, you, you still might end up feeling like a victim. Um, a burglar in one house might make everyone else on the block feel unsafe. Yes, it can be a big deal. Um, a lot of people's concerns get quiet if they're worried about their own safety because of something that happened to a neighbor. And um, we're saying it, it does matter. Um, the community needs to have attention paid to them um, as, as victims or, or affected parties, as we might say. And also a lot of people in the community when a crime is committed, recognize that the community actually can and has contributed to whatever conditions um, sort of make make it sort of commit a crime. Um, a lot of times, um, might not meet the needs of, of folks in our community who are struggling, and people that volunteer with us, uh, community members, see it as their responsibility to make the offender feel connected in the community so that they feel like they're worth something and that they don't need to um, engage in criminal activity to get their needs met. Um, we also talk about, in restorative justice, affected parties. Uh, these are families of offenders, families of victims, neighbors, other people that are touched by a crime. Um, really briefly, we're going to look at a couple different views. This is a great chart from, from Howard Zare's Little Book of Restorative Justice that we love to use. And, when you see columns like this, when you see criminal justice and restorative justice, I, I need to let you know that we're not saying that it's one or the other. Um, oftentimes, the criminal justice approach and the restorative justice approach are that um, work together. And certainly, in, in the West where we live, um, we honor the system that we've already created and, and figure out how to work with that. So um, we think about crime. Criminal justice typically looks as crime looks at crime as a violation of the law and the state. Restorative justice looks at crime as something that violates people and relationships. Um, criminal justice sees crime as, as something that creates guilt, and restorative justice sees it as creates obligations. In a criminal justice system, the state is the body that determines blame and imposes pain or Punishment is another way to look at it. Um, whereas restorative justice considers the stakeholders involved in determining responsibilities once a crime is committed and how to repair the harm. And criminal justice sees uh, the central focus as making sure offenders get what they deserve, whereas restorative justice looks at it as uh, what, what, do, what does the victim need and, and what is the responsibility of the offender. Um, one way that, that I've thought about this is Amy Holloway, who's the Director of Victim Services with the Vermont Department of Corrections, um, did a training a few weeks ago where she passed out articles in the newspaper about crimes that were committed and, and said, pretend you're an alien from another planet looking at these articles about crime. But what are they saying? And what we realized is it's focused almost completely on the offender, who, like, who is guilty, um, who should be to blame, who should be punished, and what do they deserve. And we saw almost nothing mentioned about the victim in any of the articles. And so the next slide sort of breaks this down in a different way. Um, let, me, let me interrupt for a second, uh, Mel, if I can. If you're able to mute your phone, that'd be great, or use star seven. Uh, there's some ambient noise that's sort of interfering with quality of the presentation. So if you're able to do that, fine. And then, uh, Star seven again to unmute and go from there. Thanks. Okay. So, um, and I mean, another thing to think about is it's called criminal justice. So, right there, that more than implies that we're talking about the criminal. <laughs> I mean, to us. So, some questions um, that criminal justice asks are: What laws have been broken? Who did it? What do they deserve? Whereas. Restorative justice questions are who has been hurt or harmed or impacted, what are their needs, and whose obligations um, arise from um, that crime. On the next slide, um, a restorative lens. lists five key principles to seeing restoratively, and this is pretty much some of the stuff that we've talked about. It there's a focus on harms and consequent needs of the victim, community, and offender. Um, Restored, in a restorative context, we would address the obligations. We would use an inclusive, collaborative process. Um, we try to involve stakeholders as much as possible, you know, rather than just talking about 
person who offended and what we think they need or the victim, we try to involve those folks in letting us know what they need. Um, and there's an effort to put right wrongs that were committed. Now, our work is not outcome-based, which is one of the things that makes it difficult to report. Um, we, we, don't, we don't really go for numbers. We're, we're doing some very interpersonal work here. Um, and we also have to remember, talking about putting right the wrongs, that wrongs can't always be put right. Um, a lot of times if someone's been victimized, they're not going to heal. Um, you know, there are steps that we can take to make things better for that person, but the truth is, if someone has been, you know, offended against, um, that, that just might be with them for the rest of their life. So, you know, we, we talk about putting things right, but we don't um, talk about that as a necessary outcome because it honestly doesn't always happen. So I'm going to talk for a couple minutes before we welcome our guests about um, a couple of the programs that we do at the Justice Center, particularly the restorative reentry program that, that Zach and I um, are a part of. The first program I'm going to talk about is the Reparative Probation Program, and that's been around Vermont for about a dozen years, and has been, quote unquote, owned by the Justice Centers for about three and a half or four years. Now, the Reparative Program is a victim-centered restorative justice process. It's a panel of trained citizen volunteers who meet monthly, and with the person who offended uh, in various crimes, they address these restorative justice questions um, that we've been talking about, you know, who is harmed, how are they harmed, and what can be done to make right the wrong. Um, on a monthly basis, the reparative panel meets with uh, those who have been referred to us by the Department of Corrections um, to learn about the impact of their crime, make amends to the victim and community when also to learn ways to avoid reoffense. Um, and let's see, if a victim wants to come to the reparative panel, um, their input can be considered. You know, they could write us a letter saying what they'd like the offender to hear. Um, so we, we try to, whenever possible, involve the victim needs in determining how the, um, the participant, the offender, can take next steps. And the other active program that we have here is that, that revolves around restorative justice is the Restorative Reentry Program. And this emerged from uh, Serious and Violent Offender Reentry Initiative funding. It's a collaboration among the Department of Corrections, that's local and state, um, the town government, and the Community Justice Center. Now, different community justice centers have different relationships with all of these entities. Um, for instance, we're in the town building. Other justice centers are in the police department, others are just totally off on their own, um, but there's some stake um, from all three of these entities when, when we're doing restorative reentry in Vermont. Our model is based on the work of the Mennonite Central Com Committee and others, like um, multiple you know, tribal communities who have been around for a long time, and also work in more westernized societies like New Zealand, who's um, their, their process, a lot of their criminal justice processes are are very restorative, actually. Um, and our Justice Center, particularly our reentry program here, relies almost completely on volunteers. Um, we have a community advisory panel, which is a group of, oh man, um, which is a group of professionals and community members who meet with returning folks to sort of co-create um, a reentry plan. And we have circles of support and accountability, or COSAs, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute. We also have one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which is a new program um, that pairs adults up with adult offenders who are returning to the community. And um, it's really wonderful, but it's not as restorative as COSAs, certainly. Um, okay, so I'll wrap this up talking about COSAs, and then we'll invite friends to join the conversation. The COSA is a group of three to five trained community volunteers that meet with a core member who someone um, returning to the community after incarceration. They agree to meet for at least one year, for about an hour to an hour and a half a week. Um, also, depending on the needs of the COSA or the, the individual in the COSA, there could be additional get-togethers, phone calls, you know, going out to do social activities like bowling. Um, and the COSA, the Circle of Support and Accountability um, supports the core member through reentry and beyond. Ideally, the, the planning starts about three months before the person is released. And um, when the 
person is released into the community, um, particularly if they don't have any family or friends around, the COSA can be really instrumental to just sort of being a, a supportive group saying, well, we want you back here. Um, we're excited to have you here, and we're going to be here for you whenever you need us. Um, if we're going back to talking about needs in a restorative justice context, the COSA initially can really really meet a person's need for, for belonging and connection and support, among other needs. And um, as part of the acronym, there's, there's accountability, and the COSA holds the, the core member, who's again the, the person who's returning, accountable for fulfilling their reentry plan, which involves stuff from you know, finding housing, finding employment, all the way to addressing the restorative justice questions, uh, who was harmed and what we to make things better. Um, and the COSA also holds the person accountable to living appropriately in the community, you know, being safe, um, being a contributing member of society, um, you know, managing things like um, anger and violence that could put other folks in the community at risk. And again, uh, we talked about restorative justice questions and try to do some restorative justice work in the COSA. And uh, oh, yes, I lost my screen a second. Hold on. Oh, there I am. Okay. Sorry about that. Sure. So a couple things that we think about when we're doing COSAs is accountability is a goal, not a punishment. That's a quote I really like that our former um, coordinator mentioned when she was doing a training, you know, especially since a lot of accountability is based on the core member's plans, you know, how he or she hopes to, to live well in the community. Um, it's really about us holding folks accountable to what their own goals are, and um, it's not it's not a punishment. Um, another quote that I really like that's from a Canadian Correctional Services training on COSAs is, the goal of COSA members is not to pass judgment, but to articulate standards. Um, you could think about that and see what that means to you. Um, a couple other things about COSAs, and then we'll, we'll open it up to our, our guests. When applicable, the core members, probation officer, and others in their community of care can be involved in the COSA. That could also mean, you know, sex offender, therapist, um, a landlord, you know, other people that are involved in the core member's life who could really sort of band together to um, make the reintegration as successful as possible and with as much communication and transparency as possible. And also, with the guidance of the coordinator, the COSA can facilitate conferences or meetings with affected parties. This means we can do, we can do um, restorative activities like victim-offender dialogues or family group conferences that involve uh, other folks that have uh, some sort of stake in the offense and whatever obligations were created um, from that offense. So um, I'm going to turn it over to, um, I guess, us, continued, and also our guest, Javon, who is a participant in a post that we hosted for over a year, right? Yeah. And also Karen, who is a position officer at our local office and working with us for over a year as well. So we're just going to ask a couple questions, and if you could please hold your questions until we're done with this portion, that would be great. So would my first you, uh, introduce, Would you introduce our guest again, Mel? Why don't you guys introduce yourselves the way you want to introduce yourselves? My name is Javon Bostic. Uh, well, I'm uh, the sort of justice center. Uh, I'm going to have to ask Javon to uh, speak up, please. Sorry, my name is Javon <laughs> Bostic. Um, I guess you could say that I'm the core member of a uh, COSA panel. Right above Vermont. Great, welcome. My name is Karen Hay, and I am actually his probation officer at the local Brattleboro Department of Corrections Probation Office. Great. Welcome. So, Javon, I want to ask you first, what has your experience been like working with COSA? Um, it's, first off, like, as far as, like, um, also panel, like, I don't know, I see them as, like, my safety net, like, um, also, I've known before I was ever um, involved in a um, judicial system. Uh, um, yeah, uh, um, and an experience. <laughs> so let me 
ask, let me ask a more specific question. What, what are some of the challenges that you've worked through with your COSA? Um, Uh, mm, <laughs> money? I, I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, Karen suggests to talk about using the COSA to work on dealing with Karen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess like I haven't really had like any real major issues with my COSA. Thankful to, you know, like since. Since I've been um, a part of the COSA panel, like my, I know uh, Mel talked about goals and so forth and so on, I've had some, I had some detailed goals to start out with, like that I, I, I had them set in my mind, like even before you know I was ever you know involved in a COSA panel, goals such as get specific goals such as getting a job that paid over ten dollars an hour, you know I got that, you know. Get in a vehicle, you know, I got that. In fact, I got the exact vehicle that I wanted, you know. Um, uh, uh, getting my license back. Uh, um, we're still, right now, we're still working on a housing situation. I'm not even worried about that, you know. I, I, I try to stay optimistic in the sense that, you know, I just believe that everything's going to come together for me. And, I guess the COSA panel, my COSA panel, and, you know, have a um, link in that chain. They've been my safety net, you know. They've been, you know, my backing. And, you know, like me as an individual, you know, always trying to look on the brighter side of things, you know. I, it, I, 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 like, it's even easier for me to do that, like, with them, like, um, supporting me. Can I ask what what is the housing situation now? The housing situation right now. Originally, when I got out of um prison, um I they my COSA panel actually got me um linked up with a local landlord in town, who gave me a discounted rent off of an apartment which, you know, he was he was fixing up and the. It was I was supposed to be helping them, but right now, ever since then, it's kind of been shaky. Where it's been like money involved, you know, trying to save up money for an apartment. I eventually did get an apartment, and but I had a shady landlord and maintain it properly, and I had to move out because it was a health hazard. And right now, it's been like jumping from couch to couch, basically living with roommates and so forth and so on. So, I mean, it's, it's a shaky housing situation, but, you know, I know, again, that, you know, everything is going to work out. And um, I guess you could say one of the uh, things that my COSA panel does, like, they help me with budgeting. You know, we talk about, you know, money issues, uh, um, um, perspective, apartments, you know, in the area. You know, they a lot of them have connections that I don't, you know. And so, yeah. Thanks for that. Why don't we, uh, if we want to hear a, a statement from the probation officer, then we get to a, a couple questions from our attendees. Sure. Yeah, I was just going to ask Karen um, to describe her relationship with the Justice Center and um, how COSA impacts the work, the work she does. Well, in the beginning, I'll admit it was a little bit rough. Um, Working for corrections, we tend to be a little bit suspicious of anybody trying to help us. <laughs> uh, but um, through through a lot of work, a lot of dialogue, um, we were able to all get on the same page of music. And since then, it's the their help. I, I have currently two two core members, two probationers that are core members, and one person. I um, basically have a date in my mind that they'd probably be back in jail by um, just because of past supervision histories and psychiatric issues. And this person is not, not only still out, but is actually doing very, very well within the community. And what it's allowed me to do is to really be able to focus on this person's 
treatment um, and you know more of the the correctional type view issues, whereas different things like esteem building, understanding accountability, learning about responsibility, uh, learning how to simply socialize, all those things that normally I just don't have the time to do, they, the COSA was able to work with me and work with this person to make happen. Um, I think, to be honest with you, the only reason the person's still out on the street now is because he has a COSA. I want to, Drew, if it's okay, I want to ask one more question before we open it up. Is that all right? Sure. Okay, I want to ask both um, Javon and Karen what accountability means to them in a COSA's context. Um, basically, accountability, accountability to me basically means being held to um, held to your your word, your standards, your beliefs. Um, held to you know what's what's. I don't know. I'm just like sticking to it. Responsibility. I'd, I'd have to say I pretty much second that, and it's it's really about not just the accountability to um, the the laws, the probation orders that are out there, but that it means that they are that through this accountability, they're they're really paying attention to their own needs in order to make it so that they're less likely to reoffend, as well as looking at the community's needs um, to reintegrate and not be the that person walking down the street that everybody needs to point out that through their actions they're proving that they can they can hold true to the social norms and laws. Thanks guys. So I guess it's question time. Yeah if you want to unmute your phone and you have a question for Mel or Zach or our guest uh, panelists uh, let's hear them. We explained it too well. <laughs> Any questions for our panelists on the presentation? Yes, thank you. Um, one of the questions, and I don't recall who the first person talking about COSA, but I was wondering how you were measuring or if you've gotten to a point yet where your program's been old enough that you can measure your outcomes as to how well the program is being um, recognized by the community and how the offenders or the offenders are coming out of that COSA and generally how long do they stay in the program? Okay, I, I heard a couple different questions in there. I think um, I want to make sure I'm hearing you right, but one of them is about how we're basically uh, reporting this or measuring outcomes and the other one is, right. yes. is how long folks are sticking with the program? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. To answer your first question, um, that that is that is a toughie because we ha we actually haven't been around for a bit. we've only been doing restorative reentry for about two years, but throughout that time we have been reporting to um, the state Department of Corrections with our our numbers of uh, of folks, but the numbers are low. Um, you know, there, there are only about five people or so doing COSAs at any given time. We're not talking big numbers here. Okay. And then... Um, Brattleboro, sorry. Brattleboro. Am I talking loud enough so you can hear? Um, yeah, I also turned up the volume as well. Okay. So yeah, so did I. Um, I was just reading about this program called Critical Resistance, which is a nationwide program where they have that same concept where they mm -hmm. want to quit building prisons, well maybe not the same mission, but the, the concept is um, to quit building prisons and I was wondering if that's something that maybe you would be interested in connecting with to build your program. Well thank you, thank you for the recommendation. Um, I've heard of critical resistance and that's definitely something we would look into. I, I definitely see our, our mission as, you know, I'm not necessarily Smashing the state per se, but um, coming up with with alternatives, and I certainly believe that uh, most people uh, can do well in a 
alternatives who are currently incarcerated. I do too. And your other question was um, about how long folks participate. And since yeah. we've only been around for two years, um, I can say in, in our anecdotal experience, anywhere most from you know two years, a relationship that's still going on since the very beginning. Um, so, so it can go up to two years. We, we ask that people stay on for a year, um, but after that they can stay or go. And there have been a couple instances where it, it really hasn't worked out. Either the core member hasn't engaged or there have been other sorts of uh, personal problems. But um, no matter what, if we decide to end a COSA, there's a, a collective conversation about how, why, what happens next. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question. Sure. Um, a couple things. One, um, just for clarification, the the actual um, offenders who are returning to the community are the core members, meaning the, 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 the Vista AmeriCorps members? No, you know, someone, I think Drew predicted that one might come up. Um, no. <laughs> core, it's, it's C-O-R-E, as in the core of an apple. Okay. Kind of thing. So the core, when I'm talking about core members, I'm talking about a formerly incarcerated individual who's coming back to be on a COSA with other community members. Okay. And, and is this an AmeriCorps program at all? Um, we do utilize uh, AmeriCorps volunteers, but it's not an AmeriCorps-based program. I actually was a VISTA um, when I came here, and I was Zach as a VISTA, but that's... Yeah, it's okay. more of an AmeriCorps VISTA program at this point with Zach's uh, contribution. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then my second question was, um, the, the core members, I'd like to assume they're involved in, in uh, developing and, and performing restorative justice projects? Sure. Yep. What are, what are examples of, of, of some of those type of projects? Um, great question. One example is um, we do this program, and I don't know if Jackie Austin is on right now from Madison Area Urban Ministry, um, but we, we inherited a program from, from Madison Area Urban Ministry called the Returning Prisoner Simulation, um, where people get to um, do a simulation of walking in the shoes of a person who's being released from prison and also get to walk in the shoes of uh, being service providers during that experience. And we had one... Um, participate in that simulation, he acted the role of a probation officer and also spoke at the end about his experience with reentry. And what it was was a really, I think, empathy building exercise for him, um, a way to understand what it felt like to be in someone else's shoes. And we think it maybe built up his capacity to work with Karen, and she's nodding. <laughs> um, and also, you know, giving him the opportunity to share his story of um, defense it can be viewed as a, at least somewhat restorative activity of, you know, educating others, giving back to the community through sharing information. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We probably have time for uh, one more question, if there's one. I, I do. I have a question. Please go ahead. Um, I'm part of a uh, the reentry process here in the state of Missouri, which is different from the um, from the the program that you guys are doing, in the sense of involving the victim and the offender. Ours is pretty much focusing on trying to have the offender successful in the community. Do you guys work in in that direction? As, I guess my big question is. And working with the offenders, and, you, and I know you're trying to have them be responsible for the offense that they have uh, committed, but I know the one gentleman talked about the assistance with the rent. My question is, is if, if you do something like that, do you help them at all with issues that involve the state's child support office? Um. Well, so is your, is your question particularly about child support, or are you asking about whether it's it's more offender-centered than we make it out to be? It's about how you would deal with the offenders that are coming out that have mm -hmm. substantial child support. Right. Um, well, we don't. We generally don't provide monetary support. That's one thing. Right. Um, and I think to answer your question, the the ways that we end up being most helpful with something like that 
are, um, you know, first off, always, always first trying to empower the core member to use his own assets and resources to come up with his own solutions. Um, but of course, it comes to a point sometimes where that can't be possible. And as, as Javon was saying, um, the folks in his circle were people who are well connected in the community and can use their pull <laughs> and connection to um, help people deal with stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm sure you're working with some folks who come out and don't have very good reading skills or writing skills, and that might be a factor for um, dealing with agencies and might be a way that uh, volunteers can help out is really just actually doing that work alongside them. Um, I don't know if that, if that is uh, addressing your question. So you don't necessarily have Vermont state agencies in this particular program? Not at the moment. I think ideally when the reentry program was created, that was part of the idea. And it's really something that I'd like to work towards. Um, but there are the only really formal relationship we have is with the Department of Corrections right now. Okay. Thanks for asking. There's a, there's a question on the chat board that says, um, do you do any advertising to the community to make them aware of your program? Oh, well, I'll let Zach talk about that since he's the VISTA. <laughs> uh, well, thank you to whoever asked the question. And yeah, um, we, uh, since we are so community volunteer driven, we are often out at events and uh, holding information, ses information sessions to explain the value of our program and the importance of having community represented at the table. Um, and we also do news releases and, uh, you know, radio shows and TV events to explain our work and really, um, really put our value out there to the community. That sounds great. I'm going um, to give the last, oops, if I can, I'm going to try the last slide so that I can't do it. All right. The last slide just has the information for um, that at the mail. If you have, uh, if you're interested in um, communicating with them further, so there's the uh, that's the contact info for Mel Motel and Zach Trent, the Vista in this program. And just a, one headline is that I'm going to send an evaluation to everybody who's on the call today. And if you would be kind enough to take a moment to uh, give me your feedback on that, so we can um, improve these as we go along. And uh, I, I appreciate that. Any any last questions before we have to turn it off? I'm going to take that as uh, as uh, it's time to end. So I'm going to just thank uh, in depth our our two guests and then our two presenters, uh, Mel Motel and Zach Trent from the Brattleboro Community Justice Center, who did a wonderful job to prepare this for us today, and also with a wonderful job in presenting. And I'm really pleased and. Uh, and very appreciative of their efforts in this in, on behalf of the reentry program here. Um, so Mel and Zach, thanks so much. Thanks, Drew. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, please relay our thanks to uh, your your guests as well. You're so we thanks. appreciate that. <laughs> um, we're going to have another webinar in a couple weeks, or even less than a few weeks, on um, and that's from the community Center for Community Safety out of Winston Salem, and they've done a 12 city vista. Um, Case study uh, a case study on the 12 city uh, reentry initiative. We're going to I'll um, advertise that in a few days, but I want to give you a heads up about that and uh, look look for that as our next webinar. So I'm appreciative to those who were able to join us today and to our presenters and our guests. Thanks again, and I'll close it at this time. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.